from deep in the heart of West Texas. It's the Tim Kreitz Adventures Podcast. Talking motorcycles, music, beer brewing, pop culture, adventure, and all points in between. Now, here's your host, Tim Kreitz. Well, how are you doing, everyone? Are you confused right about now? How about you regular subscribers? You saw this pop up in your subscription feed and you were like, what is going on over on the Tim Kreitz Adventures channel? A podcast? Yes, I'm doing a podcast. I have actually been thinking about doing this for quite a while now. I haven't really said anything to anyone, but I've decided to go ahead and pull the trigger on it. Try it out and see if it works. As some of you guys may know, I've been doing a lot of terrestrial radio here in West Texas lately, and that has sort of inspired me to do this radio style podcast for the YouTube channel simply because it's a great avenue for me and the guys, Britt, Cliff, Matt, everybody else, the crazy characters you see here on Tim Kreitz Adventures, to be able to talk about topical subject matter in the motorcycle world and beyond without me having to do a talking head vlog or us having to do it within the context of a moto vlog, that sort of thing. I think this may end up being a really good genre and venue by which to discuss some of this stuff. And I certainly feel like it makes good use of my radio skills and experience and as well as my audio production expertise. So I'm going to put all of those to good use, hopefully, with this little experiment and hope it takes off. I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, and as Philip DeFranco would say, let's just jump into it. I want to talk today about Trump's tariffs and their negative effect on Harley Davidson. One of the companies, by the way, the tariffs were intended to protect. It's sort of a sad irony that no matter how a tariff is executed, it always will have a negative consequence. And if not a directly negative consequence, certainly unintended consequences. That has certainly been the case with Harley Davidson. And this isn't the first time tariffs have bitten Harley Davidson. In fact, the very first time that tariffs kicked Harley Davidson in the nuts was in the early 1980s, and Harley Davidson itself was the one who had lobbied for the tariffs. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll talk about the mid-80s import tariffs on motorcycles in, in just a minute. Before I do that, here is Good Morning America's take on how the Trump tariffs negatively affected Harley Davidson. Give this a listen. This morning, an American institution announcing it will move production abroad. Harley Davidson, the American icon, now saying they will move some manufacturing overseas, just four days after Europe began slapping a 31% tariff on its motorcycles, driving up the cost of a single bike by more than $2,000. Retaliation for the Trump administration's tariffs on European aluminum and steel. After the inauguration, President Trump praised Harley Davidson and hinted that more American jobs were on the way. Thank you, Harley Davidson, for building things in America. I think you're going to even expand. The president now tweeting this morning, a Harley Davidson should never be built in another country. If they move, watch. It will be the beginning of the end. They surrendered. They quit. Okay, so first things first, I want to be fair to both sides of this argument. I'm not necessarily against the president, and I'm not necessarily against Harley in this, but it's important to point out that Harley already manufactures overseas. What is it? Bang? I think it's Bangkok, Thailand, where they have a big manufacturing facility over there for their overseas bikes, and it's the same with Triumph. Triumph does the same thing. If you are in England and you own a Triumph motorcycle, you've got a British made motorcycle. If you live in America and you've got a Triumph motorcycle, there's a good chance you may have a Thailand made motorcycle. So this globalization of production is not a new thing. And I don't think it's fair of Trump to try to demonize Harley for doing it. Do, Harley is doing essentially what it has to do in order to be able to compete in the global market. That's a very important thing for obvious reasons. So Harley makes this announcement that they are going to move more production overseas in order to get around these tariffs. And just between you and me, I have a feeling that they were going to do it anyway. That may be one aspect of this in which 
Trump's rants are correct. You guys have to keep in mind, Harley Davidson was in trouble long before this tariff business. They're not selling motorcycles like they used to. They've been in lulls before where they've had to cut back production and shut down manufacturing in the states, and that's where they are right now. So they're looking for a way to improve their efficiency and make it a little bit easier to disperse bikes across the globe. Lots of major motorcycle and car manufacturers do this. The successful ones certainly do. And we shouldn't really look down on Harley for doing this, tariffs or no tariffs. They've got to do what they've got to do at this point. And I certainly want Harley Davidson to survive. I don't want them to go by the wayside or end up some shadow of their former selves like Indian right now, which is basically just a Polaris with an Indian badge on it, but that's another conversation for another time. Granted, I'm digressing a little bit, but the larger point is that tariffs always create a mixed bag of results at best, and this is a perfect example of that. Harley-Davidson has got to get around those 31% tariffs because it's having trouble competing in Europe and Asia, especially right now as it is. Can you imagine if you got to pay $2,000 more U.S. in a place like India or Britain? to get a Harley Davidson, people won't buy them. And for those of you in the U.S. who are saying, oh, it's just $2,000 more, it's not that big of a deal, it's a big deal in poorer countries. And nothing against the U.K., I love our friends in the U.K., but most people who are considered middle class in the U.K. would be considered poor in the United States. And an extra two or $3,000 U.S. for a motorcycle, even though it's devalued compared to the euro, is it's a big deal. It's a major consideration for the average person in a place like France or or the UK when it comes to buying a motorcycle. Those are the realities of the situation. Also, you have to keep in mind that in those countries, especially taxation is way, way higher and way worse than it is here in the US. They're going to be paying higher taxes on an already overtaxed item due to its price. I mean, it could be detrimental to Harley in so many ways. Now, conversely, or at least somewhat conversely, I feel compelled to say that I do not blame Great Britain one tiny bit for retaliating with tariffs of their own. It's called a trade war for a reason, and if the shoe was on the other foot and it was some other country pulling the same tactics on the U.S., I would, I would be all for retaliatory tariffs. It's a a war in and of itself. It's a different kind of war. It's a different type of coercion, but you can't just lay down and take it when something like that is done to you. I mean, the UK is supposed to be our ally. They're supposed to be our friends. We should not have an adversarial trade relationship with a country that is such a strong ally. And to those of you in Great Britain, look, I know you guys have a lot going on socially and politically yourself with Brexit and other issues, but I, am I for one, am behind you on this. I don't blame you one little bit for retaliating. Now, the true irony of this whole situation with specific regard to Harley-Davidson is that Harley-Davidson itself in the 80s, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, lobbied successfully for tariffs against Japanese motorcycles to protect themselves. And it, in its own way, came back to bite them. As I mentioned earlier, back in 82, things were not going well for Harley Davidson. They were on the verge of folding as they have been several times throughout their history. It's been a scary roller coaster ride for Harley Davidson over the past 40 or 50 years, especially. And, you know, for a variety of economic and social reasons during that time period in the early 80s, the domestic motorcycle market was very soft and not as many Americans were rushing out to buy new bikes, kind of like now. The situation it created a bunch of undesirable factors for everybody involved. The Japanese, who were made out to be the bad guy in that tariff and trade situation, actually were themselves in trouble in their own way. They had this huge stockpile of bikes in the U.S. that their dealers weren't selling, and that drove prices through the floor. I mean, you could get a brand new Japanese motorcycle for, gosh, great, great prices back then. But those resultant price drops caused this sort of general panic with HD since they were struggling already. And they felt like they were faced with the tanking of their brand. So they came up with this plan to petition the Reagan administration for big 
big tariffs to be imposed on some imported motorcycles, specifically big bore Japanese motorcycles. Now, you know, in this modern age, you know, I know that obscenely huge corporate bailouts and massive, you know, market debilitating government, all of that stuff is just accepted as okay in the U.S. these days. But in its day, HD's petition for tariffs as a self-protection mechanism, man, it was bold as love. No one had ever really done that at Harley's level before. And the kicker about it is, is that in the beginning, Harley Davidson succeeded wildly. It was partly as a result of, you know, you know, the post Carter recession, there was a weird political climate in that day and age coming out of the Carter recession and going into the Reagan years. But either way, legislation for a five year tariff period became law. And essentially, with the stroke of a pen, a new precedent had been set. And it's one that economists are still sort of studying to this day. I have this quote from the Chicago Tribune from 1987 talking in retrospect about those tariffs. And it says, uh, let's see here, the International Trade Commission and the administration uh, approved stiffer tariffs because Japanese manufacturers had shipped more than a two-year inventory of big motorcycles into a declining U.S. market. And, you know, Harley claimed that threatened their survival. Okay, so, and it says, uh, in the first year, tariffs on heavyweight motorcycles, that was motorcycles over 700 cc's rose tenfold to 49.4 percent compare that to the modern tariffs each year now the level dropped until the tariffs reached 15 percent in their last year and then finally went away it was a temporary mechanism designed to save harley davidson now as i said heavyweight was the key word tariffs only applied to motorcycles with an engine displacement and i think it was large it was 700 cc's if it was larger than 700 cc's the tariff was enacted and that's where you got bikes like the the uh, nighthawk 700s those bikes all those small displacement japanese sport bikes and the ones that we still enjoy today came out of that era so you know it basically meant that to keep the sport motor motorcycle segment affordable high performance but small displacement engines had to be developed and that's exactly what japan did there was a day when a high performance japanese sport bike wasn't expensive believe it or not i know they're really expensive now but japanese motorcycles were once considered the affordable choice you know for riders who wanted good looking reasonably priced and bulletproof motorcycles i think that the nighthawk 700 when it came out in the early mid 80s i think it was about 3200 bucks or 3300 bucks it that's like i don't know 65 6600 dollars in 2018 dollars yeah go try to buy a brand new comparable bike mid-sized for that price you're not going to be able to do it that's anyway that's beside the point even though japan was mad about the tariffs and they steamed over the tariffs they ended up creating really really good small displacement bikes during that era to compete they got around most of the tariffs and it changed motorcycling history every pecker would who wants to get a new motorcycle wants an fz07 or a zx6r or an r6 these small displacement little motorcycles that just shag ass that is the legacy of tariffs it's an unintended consequence and even though harley thought it was going to help them in the long run it ended up hurting them because motorcycle technology coming out of japan got better and better and better for about the same price while harley davidson stayed with these big heavy motorcycles that were extremely expensive and were technologically gosh generations behind what was coming out of japan again we go back to this overall concept of Tariffs always have unintended consequences. And here we go again, history repeating itself. It's sort of an interesting thing to behold as a guy in his late 40s who has literally ridden motorcycles his entire life. Okay, since this is the very first podcast, I'm not going to make this one very long. As I start bringing in guests and doing interviews and we start having powwows and brain trusts and that sort of thing, we'll try to take this thing out to a half hour or maybe an hour. We'll play it by ear. But before I go, I do want to send out some thank yous and some shout outs. The first being to Cruise and Moto. 
Cruisin' Moto shouted me out on his channel this week, and I just wanted to say thank you, and I wanted to encourage all of you who subscribe to my channel or who might hear this podcast to go check out his channel. It was very nice of him to do that, very thoughtful, and I appreciated it very much. I really, really would like to see his channel grow, and you guys can make that happen. So go check out Cruisin' Moto's channel. I'll put a link in the description down there. Also, I wanted to express my gratitude for almost 10,000 views on the Airway Beacon episode. That was a really fun episode. I thought it was really interesting, and I thought we did a pretty good job of presenting the history of something in America that not too many people knew existed or that the remnants thereof still do exist. So thank you very much for that. To have a video that approaches or surpasses the number of subscribers on a channel is really cool. We're not quite to 10,000 subscribers on Tim Kreitz Adventures yet, but for the video to get 10,000 views when my average video will get, you know, one to 3,000 views, that means a lot to me. So thank you guys for that. I also want to let everyone know we do have some really interesting rides coming up. I don't want to let the cat out of the back on a few of them because I want them to be surprises. We've got an epic, epic ghost town adventure coming up. We're just working on getting access into the area where we want to go. And as you guys know, if you live in Texas, you know everything's private property and you've got to go through the proper chains in order to be able to go on to certain pieces of property, but we're hopeful to make that happen. There's a lot coming up. And also, I hope the podcast thing takes off. I look forward to bringing in the guys and bringing in guests and maybe even finding a sponsor or two for it. I think that would be really cool. If you you know anyone who wants to sponsor it or if you want to sponsor it get with me send me a message through youtube or hit me up on social media you can instagram me at tim kreitz adventures you can facebook me at facebook.com slash the real tim kreitz there are various and sundry ways in which you can get in touch with me also don't forget about tim lots of groovy stuff there for you to consume and observe so until next time Thanks very much for listening to the podcast, and I hope this is the beginning of groovy things to come. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. See you next time.